Okay, next, we have the small and petite IR Associate Professor Hayati Binti Abdullah. Okay, if I were to read all her accreditation and uh, <laughs> all her accolades, it will actually, uh, I'll be reading line by line because there's too many on her list here. But to, uh, very sorry, Prof, okay? <laughs> I will just go by a few which I've taken. She's, current, she's the director of UTM's Professional Qualification Development Program. She specializes in thermodynamics. She's a consultant for the Center of uh, Energy Studies, Sultan Iskandar Institute. Professional engineer registered with BEM. Chartered engineer registered with the Engineering Council of United Kingdom. Chartered engineer, marine engineer and fellow of the Institute of the Marine Engineering Science and Technology, United Kingdom. First Lady Engineer, uh, Honorary Treasurer of IEM Southern Branch. Founder of Young Women Engineer Section, UTM IEM. She has received many awards. First recipient of the UTM, uh, sorry, UTM's Excellence in Teaching. First recipient of UTM's Excellence in Academic Advising. First recipient uh, from UTM to Angura Academic Nagara. Is that right? That's one of the few in the list here. Uh, you, are free, you can feel free to ask her all her awards and all the accreditations. Can we have IR Associate Professor Hayati Binti Abdullah? Thank you so very much, <laughs> Nauri. I mean, um, okay. Uh, I know Engineer Habiba is uh, is a timekeeper. You don't really need to use your stopwatch anymore because I think <laughs> Engineer Khalida, Engineer Rafta, and Engineer Sharifa Azlina has said all everything that <laughs> there's nothing else left for me to say. So you can keep your watch, really. <laughs> but anyway, I would like to thank you so much for. Um, uh, this kind invitation uh, to um, allow me to speak today. I'm deeply humbled by this kind invitation and a very kind introduction by the gallery. Okay, so what is there left to say? Yeah? <laughs> Nothing much, I guess. Um, nonetheless, um, let me see if this works. Is this working? Not really. Not really? Oh, okay. Uh, let me try something else. Um, Okay, not working. Um, I tried that just now. You tried that just now. Where is the... There must be a... Uh, the, the battery is going on. Okay, never mind then. Alright, because I like to move around. I like to move around. Anyway, um, I think you've heard, you know, uh, all the words of uh, wisdom from Engineer Khalida. You've heard the courage from, of Engineer Rafta, you've heard the, uh, what else, uh, mm, the wonderful things from, uh, about, about highways and everything from Engineer Sharifa Azlina. Yeah? So I suppose without Engineer Khalida, we would not have all the electricity in our room and I wouldn't be able you know, to travel without the good foundation designed by <laughs> Engineer Rafta and the uh, wonderful highways though expensive, by Engineer Sharifa Azina. I wouldn't be able to reach here from Johor Bahru. Actually, I was on a road trip. I was actually from uh, Johor Bahru, and then I went to Malacca for my bowling tournament, and then <laughs> uh, and then I went to Ipoh for some work at UTP, and I was in Penang when all the earthquake was happening, right? And But um, I hope you all were okay with that. Yeah, I was in Penang. I have to be in Penang lah, when the earthquake happens. Yeah? Anyway, so I'm back here uh, in KL before my uh, last destination, which is back in Johor Bahru, where I'm based at. Um, okay, I'm not going to talk much about leadership that has been covered by uh, Azlina. I'm not going to talk about Shasha. I'm not going to talk about uh, innovation that has been covered by Rafta as well, yeah, and about motivation and growth kind of. So basically, what am I going to talk about? Yeah. I'm gonna take you back. I'm gonna take you back to your school days, to your university, to your college days. Can I do that? Because that is what I do. That's my business in education, right? And of course, um, 
being an academician, I can't go, I can't do without numbers, right? I, you know, uh, never leave home without a calculator. Yeah, so it's all in a red pen, of course. So it's always in my um, in my handbag. Yeah, and always wanting to mark something. Like when I saw this here, you know, I see a spelling mistake there. <laughs> it should be women, W-O-M-E-N, you know. And when I saw the video, it should be join, J-O-I-N, not J-O-I-T. So I have that urge. I'm so sorry. I was... <laughs> I, I guess that's the reason why I'm st still in the university. All right, so I'm going to take you back to university. Before that, I'm going to show you some numbers. Is it working, Missy? Oh, it needs a male touch. How about that? Which one? This one goes for the, yeah, and this one goes back. All right, okay. Thank you, Missy. All right. Yeah, we're in a man. Yeah. <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> once in a while. Okay. So, where do we stand? I mean, uh, I'm giving you numbers, okay? Let's look at the women workforce. Of all the Malaysian women in Malaysia, yeah, only less than half of us are actually in the labour market. Did you all know that? Not yet, okay. So I'm going to enlighten you with numbers. So, all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, by definition of the government, okay. <laughs> So 46% of us, aged 15 to 64, are in the labour market. Where are the rest? 54% are outside the labour market. Yeah? And most of them are homemakers. I think that's because traditionally women, we carry the responsibility of childbearing and child rearing. Yeah? Uh, that, that sort of thing. So that's where most of us are, who are those that's outside the labour market. And uh, of course, some of us, some of them are also students. Twenty-seven percent are students, and six percent. Uh, I'm going to join this category soon. <laughs> yeah, Kalida as well. Hopefully, not too soon. Yeah. So this is where the retirees and others are. So this is basically us, ladies. Yeah, ladies in the um, labour market in Malaysia. So not many of us. Yeah? Not many of us. Okay. Right, and let's look at the skill of us. I'm, I'm trying to converge towards engineering, women engineers. So I'm going to start very generally with women as uh, in general in Malaysia. So okay, 46% of us are working fine. And out of that, only 37%, women represent only 37% of the skilled workforce in Malaysia. Yeah. So what's happening? What's happening? Yeah? How many years have we reached independence? Yeah? So only 37 of us, uh, 30, women represent only 37% of the skilled workforce in Malaysia. And this is uh, something you saw in uh, as Sharifa Azlina's slide. She was mentioning that 7.5 uh, or 7.8% of women are sitting on the boards. Yeah? So that, I suppose, 48 organisations translates to that. 7.8%. Yeah? Only 48 organizations in Malaysia have women directors in their respective boards. This is as reported in the star. Yeah? So, you know, but the government is doing something about it. Yeah? And as you know, the government has, um, well, now, no longer Shari, that Najib, I suppose, uh, formed this uh, NAM, this a new actually, NAM Institute for the Empowerment of Women. I suppose you have heard of it where they set a target of at least 30% women decision makers in the corporate sector by 2016. Yeah. Uh, the public sector is not such a worrying big, uh, concern because we have about 33% yeah, uh, women holding a high position in the government sector, in the public sector, but in the corporate sector, yeah, that's where we are lacking. So that's why they've set up this uh, government's women directors program and they're actually grooming about 250 women directors by the end of this year. That is the target. Yeah? So just to let you know what's happening. Uh, so we don't have enough skilled workforce. So who's, is it the universities are not doing anything about it? Yeah? Are the universities not producing enough women skilled workforce, Abiba? Yeah? What do you think? The entrance, the, the entrance is yes, 
after the graduation is the choice of the woman. Okay, so the academicians will say, hey, it's the industry. And the industry will say, hey, look, you know, look at the quality of the graduates that you're producing. You know, so let's, let's look at the numbers. Let's look at the numbers, okay. Women with tertiary education yeah, have increased by almost 50% since 1980. So you can't really blame the university, can you? Yeah. So we, 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 you know, we have, you know, we have increased by 50% since 1980. In fact, if you look at the current statistic, it says for every 13 female graduates, there are only 10 male graduates. So there are more female graduates than male graduates. This is what the statistics say, right? So what's happening? You know, why don't we have the numbers that we wanted? And yet, the universities are actually producing more female graduates than the male graduates. Okay, okay, that is in general. Okay, so oh, that's in general. Let's look at engineering. Who wants to take up engineering nowadays? Okay. I'm from UTM. Habiba is from UTM. And we have another friend here also from UTM, right? So, you know, of course, I'm from UTM, so I believe UTM is the greatest university <laughs> in Malaysia. <laughs> you know, there might be some truth to it, you know. I think we produce the most number of, uh, we have a very big, yeah? We have a very big engineering um, um, uh, school, yeah? not, not just, we have many faculties. Yeah? In fact, if you go to UKM, they only have one faculty, one faculty of engineering and with all the departments of engineering, different disciplines. But in UTM, Every discipline has its own faculty. Yes. So that's how huge you can. We have so many UTM alumni here. Anyway, Rafta June is also from UTM, right? Okay. Yeah, I'm coming from this. Okay, where to go with So I believe that UTM is the greatest university in Malaysia for engineering at least. Yes. For engineering. Thank you, Khalida. To get that from Khalida, you know, that means a lot. Okay, so let's look at how many engineering female undergraduate i'm just looking at undergraduate not postgraduate yeah? female undergraduate engineering students in utm jb campus only utm jb campus how many percent are female from 2006 it was 31 percent yeah now it is almost 35 percent so 35 percent of the 35 percent of the engineering students are female so that's quite a big number um, you know, we don't really have quota or anything like that. Um, well, uh, we don't publish it, but you know, there are some <laughs> unwritten things, yeah. But this is it. So we have about thirty-five percent of our students, um, uh, engineering students, are female. So that's not a bad number, isn't it? That's not a bad number at all. Okay, let's look at the the discipline where the female engineers are not that many. Yeah, don't talk, I think electrical, we have quite a number of female engineers or civil, right? Mechanical, you know, only the crazy ones and, you know, my friend used to describe those who look like men, you know, take mechanical engineering. <laughs> like men, okay, never mind. So let's look at, let's look at the mechanical engineering. So this is my faculty, right? This is where I uh, teach, yeah? So even, even in the faculty of mechanical engineering, yeah, we have about more than 16%. Yeah, more than 16% of the uh, mechanical engineering students are female. So the students are there, the universities are producing. Yeah? The universities are producing the engineers, right? But look at this. These are the, this is at least, you know, I, this is something June and Mizi need to do something about this. You need to update this up until 2011 or 2012. This is the only data I have. I don't know whether you have any recent data on the membership of IEM and BM on lady engineers, yeah? Okay? So if the universities are producing 35% yeah, of the engineering students, female, right? Let's look at the numbers here in IEM, yeah? In IEM. So we have in 2007, 15,000 members, only 1,500 are lady. Yeah, only 1,544. That's about uh, 10%. Yeah? That's almost 10%. Only 10%. 35%, that's in only in UTM, and only 10% managed to stay in engineering. Yeah? So, you know, we, we, how do we address this gap there? We need to do a gap analysis there, yeah? And BM, how about BM? 
at least if they don't join IEM, they must register with the board because it's compulsory, it's mandatory to register with the board of engineers within the first six months of your uh, first employment, right? So they should register. So how many registered? 6,000 out of about 60,000. So that's again about 10, 11%. Yeah? So we are the lady engineers. Where are they? I know a lot of them are in HSS, but where else are they? You know, where else are they? Okay? So um, let's look at how the uh, training of engineering in Malaysia is being done. You know, this is how it's being done in Malaysia, right? You go to a university, UTM provides uh, some theoretical knowledge for four years, and after that, you know, they go out to the industry, another three years, that's what BEM requires, minimum three years of practical experience, and then you end up, you know, then you can collect all your courage and all your documents and drawings and go for your professional interview. That's how it's done. Okay? So, are we not doing enough here? Or are we not doing enough there? Yes, to retain all these female engineers. Yeah? And um, if you would, I think all of this have been mentioned by all our three speakers. The, the industry always complain, they always complain. They say, look, you know, um, your, the fresh graduate cannot, what's the first thing they say? Cannot communicate, right? They say cannot communicate, don't have that soft skill. So one of the, this is not just for the female, but also for, I think, in general. Yeah? In general, they say, you know, acquisition of soft skills. That's something that needs to be improved. And we've done quite a bit in the university as well. Yeah? We, we've done a lot of now team working and whatnot, whatnot, right? Okay, and what else? Uh, maturity. Inability to articulate their thought process or express themselves. Well, I think I was there 20, 30 years ago. I mean, this thing, the maturity you need to develop over the years, right? When you first graduate, I don't think, I always like argue with those from the industry. Come on, you're not where you are here, if not for the 30 years of experience that you have, right? So don't expect a ready-made engineer. We can only prepare them with the basic knowledge, and that is most important, the, the principles yeah, of engineering, the foundation, that is important. And then, you guys, you guys in the industry, you transform them into an engineer, right? Well, that's what I believe. Anyway, so what else? Uncertainty of the future, fear of the unknown, you know, makes it difficult for them to communicate as well. Uh, this is more for the women engineers. Inclusive environment, you know, we have specific needs. Yeah. So I think, you know, we have children, some of us, yeah. So I think I have seen some companies, I think Standard Chartered, one very good um, uh, organization which caters for, which addresses specific needs of women. Yeah. Uh, and also another one is Intel. They have flexible hours. Yeah, they can Intel, you can bring your children to your workplace, they will have some areas for the children to. So I think women, given you know, some uh, environment yeah, that is conducive, that is women friendly, yeah, I think they will do very well in the organization. And the organization will do well by providing this inclusive environment yeah, so that they won't feel sidelined. Yeah? And of course, this is what uh, Engineer Azina pointed out, female empowerment. Yeah. I think ladies, we are a little bit hesitant to speak up or show what we are capable of in a male-dominated environment. So these are usually the issues of the young women engineering graduates. So how do we address that? So what can the university do? What can the university do? So when I teach, <laughs> this is the first thing the students see in my class, think. Because I believe that what we need, yeah, what Malaysia needs are thinking engineers. That's what we need. Yeah. If they can think, they can be creative. If they can think, they can be innovative. Right? So they need to think. Not just outside the box. They must think within the box first before they can actually think outside the box. Yeah. So this is what I emphasize to my students. Because if the engineers don't think, this is what's going to happen. Yeah? You see that? These are all real. These are all real. 
This is what happens if you don't have thinking engineers. What else can happen? They get dumped up there. <laughs> sure. Staircase to nowhere, right? What about this? I insist. <laughs> oh, this is the envy one. No. Yeah, I insist. Innovation, innovation. Yeah, so much for innovation, right? Three likes. Ah, this one I like. <laughs> So this is what happens if you don't have thinking engineers. I can never ever get my money out of that machine. I don't know about you, but I, you know. So I think that's what we're doing in university. We're looking at more, when we're teaching, we're talking about the teaching and learning process. We are not just looking at, this is the way forward, this is the way to go forward. Any of you from the uh, education line, eh? we're not longer looking at the Bloom's taxonomy. No more remembering, understanding, and then going up the hierarchy. No. We have to be integrated. I would like to use Feng's taxonomy. We have not used it in UTM, but this is what I would like to introduce here. Yeah? Feng's taxonomy. So everything has to be integrated because at the end of the day, yeah, we don't solve textbook problems. You may solve 1,500 textbook problems, but when you go out, real world problems are far more complex. So this is something that we need to look at. So I am trying to get you know, UTM and also to get involved in this, something that um, MIT has been doing, University of Liverpool has been doing this course, Conceive, Design, Implement, Operate Approach, CDIO Approach. That's the new, I think, way forward for engineering education. And also, I think our uh, future engineers uh, need to do engineering, not just the normal, ordinary, and they have to like, Engineering for sustainability. Engineering for humankind. That is what I see the way forward for engineering education. Yeah. All right, okay. Habiba is giving me the time again. So that's what the university can do, right? But what can you do? What can you ladies help us in the university? Help the young female future engineers in it. What can you do? So these are some of the things that I list down. And of course, like Alida has to take away my point by mentioning the adjunct lecturer thing, yeah? So I would definitely, definitely encourage you ladies here, you have enough experience, and you know what the problems are with the fresh graduates and whatnot, so come forward and help us. Yeah, don't just comment, you know, criticize. Come, do something about it. Let's bridge this university industry gap, okay? So come and serve as adjunct, not junk, J-U-N-K, yeah? just adjunct lecturers, yeah? In fact, UTP, because I was in UTP a few days back, UTP has this, they have hundreds of adjunct lecturers. Yeah? And uh, Purdue University, same thing. They have more adjunct lecturers than the permanent staff. Okay? So, please, do come forward and serve. Share with us your expertise. Yeah? We need them at the university. Come and deliver. Just come for two hours. Not talk, yeah? I don't believe in this talk. Lectures. Because in the university, we have our own course learning outcome. We have our outcome. This is what we want the students to learn. So you know our outcome, what we want the students to learn. You come and help them learn. Yeah? And they get hands-on from you. Yeah? So come and serve as adjunct lecturers and deliver lectures. Socialize and inspire the young women engineers. You will be surprised. They will really, really appreciate you, what you do. Yeah? Because they want to see, they want to see this um, uh, real things that the women engineers do. I often tell them stories about what Sharifa Azlina does, you know, and they really get inspired when they hear stories of Sharifa Azlina. I know I didn't ask her permission. Now can I have? <laughs> can I have your permission? I've been telling all my students about Sharifa Azlina's experience, and they were like, all oh, yeah, their, you know, will be, they will be so so impressed by that, yeah. And even as an academician, sorry, I'm going to take a few more minutes, okay. Uh, you're an academician? Even in an academician, please, you need to go out. You need to go out to the industry. That's what I did. First 10 years I was in the, in, in the university. Because I wanted to get an IR. And for, for, for an academician to get an IR, you need one year of industrial exposure. Practical, that's the condition, number one condition, one year. And then as academicians, you don't get that opportunity. Yeah? So that's why in UTM, we make it compulsory. Any lecturers below, below 40 years old, compulsory for them to go out for one year, industrial attachment, and then only 
yeah, they can be promoted. So that, that that's under my unit right now. So we make it compulsory, right? Even if it's not compulsory in your university, do like what I did. Every year we have the three month semester break, and that's where I will be climbing up the um, cement plants. I've climbed almost all the cement plants in Malaysia. I'm so glad I saw someone climbing as well. <laughs> so I'm not the only one climbing. I thought I was the only crazy lady. Because that's what they call me. Some of my colleagues thought I was crazy because every three months I would go out. And they said, what do you do? I climb cement plant. Why? Because if I want to analyze combustion performance, yeah, I need to get the exhaust gas. I have to do the exhaust gas analysis. So I need to get the data. So nowadays, we have fantastic uh, softwares which can actually do performance monitoring just from the control center, right? They have sensors and whatnot. Hey, 25 years ago, I have to climb the stack. And I'm an academician. But I climbed the stacks. There was a time when I was climbing one, I cannot remember, recall which, which uh, plant, but as I was climbing, the ladder was swinging, you know. And I was like, and I had this gas analyzer, which cost almost uh, a proton saga, which 40,000 ringgit at that time, now probably more 100k. So I said, should I drop the, <laughs> should I have insurance? I have you know, indemnity, personal indemnity, but should I drop this proton saga and save my life? But then I have to answer to my boss, how am I going to justify that Proton Saga? Or do I just together, you know, drop with the Proton Saga and die and I have to answer to anyone? So the very decision making, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have to do some very, very interesting decision making. So I was like, okay. So those were the challenges that I had to go through, yeah. And one of the cement plants that I climbed, I remember I brought my students with me and she, he's a Chinese boy, very fair, you know, very fair. So we went up there, water boils at 100 degrees, right? You know, they are supposed to uh, insulate these preheaters so that they don't, you know, send their ringgit Malaysia out to the environment and pollute the environment and, you know, increase the carbon footprint, which is what they are doing. But anyway, so they did not, you know, nobody knew, nobody knew, no engineers, none of the management, GM knew that those preheaters were not insulated when they were supposed to. I was the one who went up and found out because the temperature there was 300 degrees Celsius. That Chinese boy had to run down. Dr. Baka, I blew over this. <laughs> Why? Get up, boy, burning, burning. Okay, you go down, take some uh, the barley drinks, you know. I want to go, I want to stay on and take this data and come down and prove to the management, you know, where their money is going, you know, what are they doing to the environment. So, those are the things. Yes, I am in academician, but I did that. So four years I did that, four times three is 12 months, I fulfilled the BEM requirement. So you need to get your fingers dirty. Especially if you're doing mechanical engineering, if it's electrical, never mind like they deal with clean energy, right? <laughs> yeah, but mechanical engineering, you deal with fuel oil, the dust from the cement plant, I tell you, it's not fun, but you get your fingers dirty. You get your fingers dirty, right? So, um, that's what, as, as, as an academician, you, you can still do that. So, okay, uh, you guys, now that you have all this, please come, please come and nurture. We said we, said we have, have maturity problem, so come. Help nurture maturity among the young women engineers in the university. Help them develop to become able thinkers. You know, help them to build their confidence and provide cohesive, constant cohesive support to them. Please do that. And another thing is you can do, other than serving as adjunct lecturers, you can also come and become supervisor. Yeah? Supervise. We call this capstone projects. If you, um, if you graduate from America, uh, at the end, we have a final year project. It's not like uh, in, the, in Malaysia, we have this final year project are more research based. Right? More research based. But this capstone project is more industry based, design industry based. So, so we actually, I think we are going to start, UTM is going to start on this capstone project. That means we will have a supervisor in the university and we have a supervisor in the industry for their final year project as well. So please, do come and help us yeah, become supervisors and you can be mentors to our students as well. Yeah? Not just students, lecturers. Because right now, lecturers have to get their IR as well. BM wants three IR for every program. And I'm hearing that they are going to increase to 30%. 
So therefore, the, in the engineers, in, uh, the lecturers in, in the universities need to get their IR, they need to get mentors. And it's not easy for ladies, let me tell you that. So please come and help become not just the mentors to the students, but also to the uh, lecturers. So this is how you can contribute back to the university. And hopefully we can, you know, narrow the gap between the university and the industry. So ladies and gentlemen, Habibah, I'm finally done. Thank you so very much.